Okay, welcome to another exciting episode of Freak for Accessibility. My name is Jules Good. I am your host for the evening. I am a white person with reddish brown short hair. I'm wearing gold spiky hoop earrings. I got pink lipstick on. I'm wearing a yellow shirt that has cacti on it. Behind me is a flag that says unity. You can't really see all of it though. And there's some like various symbols on it. And most importantly, I have a cockatiel on my shoulder. His name is Chompers. He is a medium sized bird with gray and white feathers and a yellow face and orange cheek circles and we are here with the wonderful amazing beautiful lovely intelligent all the good adjectives sarah fish sarah what's up hello thank you for having me um i'm sarah my pronouns are she her um i am wearing a navy rebecca for new york shirt and a black and white flannel and I have short brown hair and there's an earbud in one of my ears and there's a pillow behind me with an unknown pattern, but it's kind of pinkish whitish. Yeah. Hell yeah, we love to see it. Thank you so much for being here. So a little bit of background, Sarah is uh, interning slash being my coworker this summer at Neighborhood Access. Um, and we are so excited to have her. She's doing a bunch of different projects that we'll get into a little bit. Um, but Sarah, I would love to kind of know like your like origin story. So what kind of stuff in the disability world are you doing? How did you get here? Just give us your like X-Men origins, like backstory. <laughs> Okay, cool. So when I was like 21, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease and then diagnosed with like a bunch of autoimmune diseases um, and then Ehlers-Danlos syndrome more recently. And I kind of, I started to like make friends in the Lyme community, like when I was diagnosed. And then um, that was like more on Facebook and Instagram. And then I found disabled Twitter. And that got me like very excited about like disability advocacy. So um, I really only joined like a year or like a little over a year ago. Um, and then I wound up uh, talking to Mondaire Jones um, organizing director to get them to make their social media more accessible. And then I wound up becoming a fellow, which I didn't think I would do. And then I just got like really into I was like helping him with his disability policy and I just like got really into doing the disability stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be at Neighborhood Access. Amazing, we're so excited to have you. Um, and for the uninitiated, um, can you talk about who Mondaire Jones is? Oh yeah, so um, Mondaire Jones represents New York 17th district in Congress. Um, he won a crowded primary like a year ago, um, and he is the first openly gay black man in Congress, which we love to see. Um, yeah, and he was the only candidate with the disability platform um, until June, like three weeks before the election. Um, one of the opponents uh, wound up seeing we had we wrote a letter to the editor about the disability policy and then like five days later one of the opponents came out with one um but he he says special needs so like that's all you have to know about that <laughs> but we yeah. don't like that we do not love to see it <laughs> no not at all um, that's so interesting i didn't know that about Mondaire that he's the first uh gay black representative that's very cool yeah um and so would you say that like the pandemic got you kind of more interested in the disability organizing and like really getting like ingrained on disability Twitter. Cause I know that was totally the case for me. I just like dove in head first. <laughs> A thousand percent. Yes. Like it was interesting cause um, it was the timing of the pandemic was like kind of aligned with like when Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the primary. And so Mondaire wound up hiring some of her staffers. And so like right when the pandemic started and I had like a lot less um, to do during the day, that's when I like wound up reaching out to her. Um, and then if the pandemic wouldn't didn't happen, it, everything would have been in person and I never would have been able to get involved because I can't 
go knock doors all day. Like I can't do all of this in-person stuff. Um, and like, if I didn't, if, if we didn't have like a virtual um, campaign that I wouldn't have been able to get involved at all. So it's been, um, it was a blessing in disguise, obviously not happy about the pandemic, but like it really allowed me to like get into the disabled community. Um, like I never would have met you, you know, so many good people there. Yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating. And like, I totally get what you're saying in terms of like, like, yes, we are not happy about the global pandemic, but like it, I mean, other disabled people have been saying this for the entire time now, but it has really uh, kind of put a, a, a lens, I guess, on the fact that we can have things remotely and it's very, very possible and actually results in like good <laughs> outcomes. Um, so I'm curious um, because I know you're working for a very disability centric uh, campaign right now with Rebecca Lamort. Um, can you kind of tell us about what that experience has been like? Tell us a little bit about Rebecca and her platform because election day is a week from now um, and would love to know kind of um maybe comparing the experience of working for her campaign as somebody who is so like kind of disability focused compared to other organizing work you've done in the past it is very different um having someone whose main issue is disability justice is like it just makes things completely different and like working with a disabled person it's just like I don't even, I can't even put it into words. It's just so different. And like to see the way that like voters have reacted to her and like her story, it's like um, she, she like her leg got crushed in a subway accident like seven years ago and she has like permanent nerve damage. Um, and so she kind of like, she experiences New York in a different way than she did before. And she experiences it in a way that a lot of New Yorkers experience it now. And so she is like calling out all of the things that are inaccessible um, and like really just being the, like a voice for disabled people um, in this city. It's just, it's just so much different than like, not having to beg someone to care about it is like much different than before. Um, like when I worked for a coordinated campaign over the summer, they, I kept giving them resources to use and like they really weren't using them. Um, but like with Rebecca, like her whole team takes feedback. Um, they've made their social media accessible. Um, they've it's obviously a learning process, like no one is perfect, um, but like we've definitely made like a lot of moves. Um, and a great thing is that like, it's been so collaborative, like in March when we, or end of February, I don't know, like when um, Rebecca wanted to like reach out to like other disabled people to get their input on the platform, which is how like you and I got more connected. Um, and yeah, it was just like having that collaboration, like knowing that she wants to hear other voices in the community. It just has been so much different. She's also just like an incredible person and friend. Like, I hope we win. <laughs> yeah, she rules. And honestly, like, yeah, this this is the Rebecca Lamore Depreciation Hour. Um, yes. <laughs> but truly, like when she reached out, she had emailed me and was like, Hey, can you like give some thoughts on my platform? And I was like, Oh yeah, I would love to. And I, you know, I put some feedback in like not really knowing her, what her deal was. I was like, Oh, whatever. Like, this isn't going to go anywhere, but I, I can say I tried. And she incorporated a ton of it. And like had, we had really generative discussions about, um, you know, just different language usage and, and how to kind of um, phrase things in a way that makes sense to people who, aren't disabled or who aren't close to somebody who has a disability, like who just have no like frame of reference for this, this life. Um, and so, yeah, she is super wonderful. And I'm so glad that we were able to connect more over her campaign because she rules. So if you live in Manhattan, question mark. It's just, the, it's like a sliver of the Upper East Side of Manhattan. 
Okay. Um, but anyone can volunteer. So come join the team. <laughs> so if you, yeah, come join the, the team because we can do virtual and in person. Yes, we have accessible <laughs> options. You can text bank, phone bank, um, come in person if that's your thing. Um, oh. We have everything captioned. Um, and like, obviously, like we do our best to accommodate people, like whatever they need. Yes. Yeah. So do it. Yes. <laughs> um, so do to do. Um, so aside from the fabulous Rebecca, um, we get to work on some other stuff together this summer. Um, so can you tell, tell the people what you've been doing with neighborhood access thus far and kind of what the experience has been like for you? The experience has been very exciting so far. Um, so far I've been, um, I have been like looking for some grants for like the project, like the um, mobility aid and assistive technology yard sale project. Um, and I've never had to look for grants before. So like, it's an interesting process. Um, and then another thing I've been doing, I'm trying to like, um, collect like almost like a database of disabled artists and then like use and then I don't know like hopefully like make buttons with their art on it and then be able to sell them and then give some of the money to the artists and then have some of the money for neighborhood access um and then am I allowed to say the GOTV thing okay we have a super secret special contract that we just got that has not been formalized yet. So we can't oh. <laughs> exactly say what it is, but look out for that announcement once all the paperwork is uh, finagled. Um, but and then no, I'll no. also be doing social media. That's gonna start happening soon. We just decided this. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, no, it, we've been like so thrilled to have you on the team and like all of the the work that you've been doing, especially around like grants and just like kind of connecting us to more people is so fucking fabulous. And like, I truly cannot do it myself. And so it is so great to have you. Um, so it's Pride Month. It's exactly halfway through Pride Month, as a matter of fact. Um, and you know that we have been all up on Twitter with our hashtag 30 days of disabled pride, um, which has been a prompt pretty much every day, except for when Jules forgets, um, that kind of hopefully the goal is to lead to discussion about different intersections between the disabled and the LGBTQ plus slash queer, which I use as an umbrella term, uh, communities. Um, and so I'm curious, um, do you identify as queer? I'm pretty sure you do. And um, how do your queer and disabled identities interact, if at all? That's a good question. I've definitely been thinking about that. Like, I'm not really even sure at this point, um, like, to be completely honest. Like, it, there's definitely, like, some overlap in terms of, like, um, not, like, how people are treated, but, like, in terms of, like, I don't know, like, some things are, like, more difficult, like, I don't know, hard to explain, um, but not, not because, like, I don't know, okay, let me think, okay, for example, like, pride is not accessible, I know we were going to get to that point, but, like, I've never gone to pride, I can't go to pride, um, like, I think that there's just, like, a lot of exclusion from the queer community, um, like, of, the disabled community. I don't think that like they think about us enough. Totally agreed. Um, and yeah, we've had a lot of folks talking about how pride is inaccessible in various ways. Um, and I mean, I guess when we say pride, we mean like the traditional kind of like hoopla pride parade slash rally um, that you see in a lot of uh, places, you know, across the country. Um, especially in more like urban areas. Um, but it is, yeah, it, it never fails to amaze slash disappoint me that there are so many fucking gays in the disabled community. Like, I feel like 80% of the disabled people I know are 
queer in some way, either like gender or sexuality, like they are either, you know, not cis hat or some combination of that. Um, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot is like, to me, the way that like those identities intersect for myself is just that like, they're two things that make me super weird. <laughs> like, like being non-binary and being disabled in multiple ways. Like, it's just like the like, raise your freak flag, like, oh boy, who is this person? Um, and I think that that totally shapes uh, like activism across both spaces and it would, lead me to believe that like because queer people are used to being you know historically kind of like marginalized and ostracized that they would want to welcome people who have those um who are marginalized in different ways but it's like I feel like some of the time it's like non-intentional which obviously isn't an excuse um but a lot of times people just don't know better in terms of accessibility then there's other times where people I think are malicious in terms of just being super ableist because there's a ton of just like fat phobia and racism and all kinds of nasty stuff that happens in the queer community as well and it, and it, it all intersects um with disability um so yeah that was a long rant but <laughs> got any thoughts on that no, I, I like totally agree with everything you said that was like definitely like a better way to say what I was trying to say. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's just like, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a really interesting cross section, which is why I've been trying to just like elicit as many responses as possible from people <laughs> online. I'm like, please tell me more about your experience. Um, so you said you've never been to a pride festival specifically maybe because it's not accessible. Um, do Sorry. you think, no, you're fine. Um, are there things that you think, like just ideas that you have for how Pride could be more accessible for you specifically? Okay, so part of my issue is that like, I just don't like, um, like loud places, busy places, crowds. So like that kind of just like makes things tough. And then so I guess having like a separate space would be helpful. Um, but like, I'm not sure like where that type of space would be, but like also there's the whole heat intolerance thing and like it's June, it's very hot, the earth is dying. Um, so it's like, I can't always just like be vertical in the heat for that long. So like, I feel like having places to like cool off would help. Um, but like also like I'm not totally sure since I've never been but like I feel like it would also just like be hard to maneuver um because I like usually use a mobility aid like either a crutch and like or I'm getting a wheelchair so like I'm like figuring out how to, I don't know how I would like navigate the crowd like I mean I would use the crutch as like a way to part like the Red Sea but like, like I could do that. Just hit people with it. Exactly. <laughs> Run them over. <laughs> Weaponize it. And I could just hit people with the wheelchair, but yeah. So I feel like that is, um, I'm not sure like what that would be like, um, like navigating it physically, but yeah, yeah. there's just like a lot of different things at play. What would make it accessible for you? Honestly, a lot of the same stuff. Like I, I think it's something that's difficult about crowded spaces like that and just the kind of the nature of pride in general is like it's very like go 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 like it's the priority is not on like resting the priority is on like partying and like being like naked in the street no I'm just kidding but like <laughs> a little bit um but, which just to be clear I will be naked in the street of pride so no no issues there um but no I I think for a lot of people um you touched on on things that that a lot of people have mentioned in, in using the hashtag and whatever like just the the heat is a big thing like having an air conditioned space where people can go and cool off having quiet spaces or just having prides or pride events that aren't like that like i want a pride that is like in 
a bookstore that is also a coffee shop that is also a bar shout out to book and bar in Portsmouth um and I just want to like show up and be gay and like listen to Kate Bush and just like have a fucking good time and I think that that is the type of pride that a lot of other disabled people would be like on on that same page um for me specifically something that can be tough about pride is even when there are interpreters um, or other like language access on the main stage when you're going around to booths there isn't any of that so if I want to go and like talk to people at all these fabulous booths and learn about their organizations like it becomes a lot harder um and then just like the yeah the over stimulation of it all can be a lot um but yeah yeah I think it's just a it's one of those things that like I think sometimes people see those types of accommodations of, of being like, okay, well then just like, don't come to pride because you don't want to like party and have a good time. But that's shitty because like, we still want to have pride. We still want to, you know, participate in the thing that pride was originally supposed to be, which is like a protest, um, which is a protest. And, um, you know, there's other ways to do that that aren't like, you know, hop, skip and go naked with fucking... 80s go-go dance music blaring in the street again nothing wrong with that it's just not everybody's cup of tea so we need to have other options um so yeah those are my thoughts yeah no I'm with you I just want like a chill vibe yeah 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 I just want to like hang out <laughs> also it'd be fun if we had like queer disabled only yeah that would be a fun event Oh my God, I can just, you imagine? Oh, that would be so fun. The number of adaptive sex toy vendors. <laughs> no one is ready, but I No am. one is ready. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, so that reminded me of another point. Um, something else I've been seeing a lot of people talk about is there are quite a, a number of uh, asexual and aromantic uh, people in the disabled community um and you know that's just like a coincidental crossover but um that is something I, I think pride definitely tends to be kind of like a hypersexualized event and for a lot of people that's not comfortable um or it doesn't feel like celebratory of their queer identity because their queer identity doesn't necessarily revolve around sex not that like others do but like you know what I mean uh it's just kind definitely. of like it's a different it's a different vibe it, um yeah and so I think that like, you know, making more comfortable spaces for that community as well is really important. Um, and that's something that I try to be, I'm trying to be mindful of because like, as soon as pride rolls around, I'm like, cool, time to be naked in the street and be a huge fucking slut. I'm ready. Get the glitter on my titties now. And like, I know that not everybody is like down with that and that's great, you know? And so like, it, it's, I'm trying to be more like, I don't know, like still be sex positive, but not be like in your face with it. You know, I think that's something that a lot of queer people are like used to doing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's like the kind of thing I wouldn't exactly have been aware of in t unless like, disabled Twitter like I feel like I've like learned so many things there about like what makes different environments hard for people um yeah and that's like one thing that I've definitely learned about that I hadn't thought about before yeah absolutely I mean I like can't I can't say enough that like my career has been built off of disabled Twitter <laughs> like everyone I know that I work with is like a byproduct of somebody that I know on disabled Twitter. Like even my like current day job in New Hampshire would not have happened without disabled Twitter. Uh, yeah, deaf Twitter specifically. Without disabled Twitter. Yeah. So it's just like it's a really special community. And, yeah. and really like just people are so kind and so like patient and willing to answer my silly questions. And I just like appreciate yeah. the heck out of them. Everyone uh, thinks Twitter is a hell site, but like, I'm a fan. I just it, mute, I'm like a very liberal muter. 
yeah uh, yeah but like I have a very long list of muted words mm -hmm. but like I mean it's just so amazing for connecting with other disabled people I mean I never would have met you right like, yeah exactly and, and like, now we're going to a concert together like Alana let's go oh my god this is unrelated I hope literally anybody listening to this will care about this but I <laughs> was on Spotify as one is and saw what else other than a new release from Alanis. And I was like, oh, what could this be? And then I saw it was Alanis and Willie Nelson. And I was like, okay, cool. And it's a version of On the Road Again, which is like a great classic banger of an old country song. The liberties that this woman takes with pronouncing words, if I have the confidence to pronounce words however the fuck I want, like Alanis Morissette does, I would be unstoppable. She's literally like, I'm the red again. I can't wait to be on the red again. Yes. <laughs> like, what are you saying? It's but very hard to decipher. Love her. Love Same. her more than anything. Also, the Big album fan. cover. I'm going to see if I can pull it up really quick because it is yeah. worth showing the people. This will be a really fun image description to do. Um, so it is like <laughs> that this is what made me uh, listen to it in the first place. No. Um, okay. So it's like Alanis, like, out the side of her convertible looking like an absolute boss yes and then just in the background like a faded like it looks like a tribute to willie nelson like it looks like he has like died and gone to heaven just like yeah. this faded ass headshot of him awkwardly like staring at her from the top corner of the screen and i can't get enough of it i think it is so funny i know that i love that she's so funny she just like does Oh, I love her. So, okay, you know Jagged Little Pill, the musical? Of course. So I was with some friends this weekend and we were talking about how like Jagged Little Pill definitely has like a plot line that centers around like upper, upper middle class white people like America. Yeah. And my friend Justin was like, he was like, yeah, it's like bougie rent. And then I forget <laughs> whether Justin or Marina said it, but one of them was like, Baby, that's not rent. That's mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> I was fully deceased. <laughs> oh my, that's a that's a good one. Rent, that's mortgage. That's <laughs> anyway, if anybody listening wants to get us tickets to go see Jack and Little Bill when it comes back on Broadway, yeah, we'll take them. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, Okay, I think those are the questions that I had for you. And I think you had some questions for me. I have one that I just thought of. Okay, do it. Inspired by my friend Kim Kaiser. Um, are you a Demi Lovato gay or a Taylor Swift gay or neither? I'm an Alanis Morissette gay. Okay. <laughs> like, like neither, unfortunately. Demi, like, ha I haven't kept up with anything they've done since like well a obviously since coming out as non-binary because I was like that's cool but then I remembered when they like had an absolute freak out at the this frozen yogurt store for like did you see that no okay here's the gist there was this frozen yogurt store that had like allergens listed like this contains dairy this contains gluten oh I forgot about that we we're like this is like promoting diet culture and I was like no it's just informing people of allergens like I totally forgot about that that was like within the last couple of years right that was like yeah like this year maybe it was like pretty recent okay yeah that makes sense like it wasn't like a long time yes and then like Taylor Swift I unfortunately have not listened to like anything yeah that she's put out since fucking like love story <laughs> like I just <laughs> I can't keep up um what about you Demi Lovato gay but also okay. like Alanis Morissette gay just yeah. not Taylor Swift gay yeah that's fair I, it's definitely like I don't know I feel like neither of them are really like really encompass my personal aesthetic which is like 
I don't know, lesbian fishermen? <laughs> well, let me rephrase it. High school me. High school me was a Demi Lovato gay. But like seven years later, um, unclear, but like very much, we need a very new... much part of my gay awakening. We need a new kind of gay. Yeah. <laughs> Who could be the next? What's who's another? Who's literally any? Oh, I'm a Phoebe Bridgers gay. What am I even talking about? Oh my god! Obviously, yes. I don't know why no one has presented that as an option. And also, Maggie Rogers. I could throw her in there too. Okay. Yes. And like Lucy Dacus, Julian Baker, like yes. I'm good with that. Yes. Maggie Rogers. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. Yeah, that's that's it. Phoebe, you're our mascot now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Obsessed with her. Yes, the best. Oh, we should go to that concert too when that happens. I'm going to see Lucy in October. Oh, right. I forgot you're doing that. I think in Boston. Oh. That sounds right. Yeah. Has Phoebe and us to tour yet? I don't know if no. she has. When? When? Oh, impatiently waiting. Facts. I hope it's soon. Um, oh, right. It's my turn for questions. Okay. So you're a musician and also late deaf. Can you like tell me how that is working out for you? <laughs> like- <laughs> I have a really, a really recent anecdote as in this happened yesterday. So yeah. So I guess a little bit of background about me. Um, so I was uh, super into music as a kid um, and when did my undergrad starting as a music education major uh I was like a pretty decent violist uh and like chompers are you taking a big old shit on me right now oh stop it stop calling me um so my brain is full of worms oh so yeah so I started college for um music education thought I wanted to be a music teacher because music teachers just had like such a positive impact on me growing up and like loved being an orchestra and then I was kind of like I knew I wanted to switch from education because I was like fuck them kids not really I have so much respect for teachers I just can't do it um but like uh I was already kind of drifting from that and then basically what happened was I started having a really hard time in my private lessons and I I was kind of like stagnating like there was just certain things that I wasn't like like I had like improved to a point and I like couldn't continue. And my teacher was always like, I don't understand how you're not hearing this right now. Like what, like what's the disconnect? I was like, okay, interesting. And then I was starting to get super exhausted, like after day classes. And I found that like when the the heater was on, it was like harder for me to understand what was going on. So I was like, huh, maybe something's up. And then I remembered that when I was a kid and when you did those like beep beep hearing tests in school, I had always failed them, but not by like a lot, only by like a little tiny bit. And so they were always kind of like, yeah, whatever, you probably just weren't paying attention. Like it's fine. Um, and so I went and got my hearing tested the summer after my sophomore year of college. And they were like, huh half of your hearing is gone. And I was like, what do you mean? Um, And so then I got fitted with hearing aids and then I ended up finishing my music degree um, because I was already in too deep and I'm not a quitter. Um, (laughs) Not that there's anything wrong with quitting, but I was just like determined. Um, And so I, yeah, I ended up entering my policy program, which is how I got to where I am now. But anyway, all of that is a long-winded way of saying I was a pretty good musician. I lost my hearing. And then I was like, wow, the greatest joy in my life is gone. And what do I do about it? Um, and so I have figured out through assistive technology and just like rethinking how I engage as a musician, like how to still do it and enjoy it. But essentially what that means is taking it in much smaller doses, um, only performing in like certain kinds of ensembles, um, like very small ensembles and ensembles where I have a direct line of sight to like everything that's going on, which is what has led me to really loving playing in um, pits for musicals, um, which like I've always been a huge musical theater nerd anyway. So I was like, oh, couldn't be more perfect. Um, And so right now I'm actually in a pit for a local production here in New Hampshire of a small musical called Terrytown, which is where you're from. Um, And 
uh, yeah, so, so that's been really, it's, it's been cool, but, um, you know, because of the pandemic, I haven't been, I haven't played with anybody in uh, over a year. Um, and my hearing loss is progressive, um, and has like definitely gotten worse. And so I was like, I don't really know what this is going to be like. So I show up and <laughs> we like start playing and I'm like, wow, this is different. Um, and I was like, I couldn't remember like what setting I was supposed to have my hearing aids on. I was like a whole complete mess. And like, I was playing for like four hours, which is like a long time. And like, I'll be honest, like I try to put a positive spin on this as often and as much as possible, but I like straight up got in my car and started sobbing after, because I was like, I used to be able to do this no problem. And I enjoyed it so much and it made me so happy. And it still does make me happy, but now it also just makes me tired and frustrated. <laughs> and so it's like, it's tough because like, it's, you know, I've been trying to find other things to do to like that, give me that same like feeling, but like nothing does. It's like a, I, I just, there's nothing that compares to the feeling of like playing in an ensemble and just having it all come together. Um, and not being able to experience that in the same way is really frustrating. Um, but like, I don't know, I'm still out here doing the damn thing. So that's a whole mood. Like, yeah. And I guess that like ties into my question about like disability can be frustrating, but like also something that we're proud of and like fine with, but like, it's so shitty to like not be able to do the things that you used to do or like not be able to do the things that you want to do or that your friends are doing like. Shitty. Yeah. 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 And it's like, I mean, I know you relate to this too, like with, you know, having a, like a, yeah, I guess like a physical disability and like other, like just compounded crap that <laughs> happens to your body. Like, you know, we push ourselves to the point of like breaking down because we don't want to miss out. And yes. <laughs> I like, we'll come home at the end of the day. I'm like, bitch, what are you doing? Like, you no, need to same. stop. <laughs> same. Rebecca's team keeps sending me home. I just keep getting it. I love them. They're the most supportive. I'm so lucky to have them. Definitely would be dead without them. Um, but yeah, it's so hard. The FOMO. Yeah. The FOMO is so real. That's another problem that I had with, this is random, but like, I had this issue with organizing, uh, like organizing on campaigns, like organizers are always trying to use FOMO to get people to do things. And so when I was volunteering for this Brooklyn City Council campaign earlier this year, before I started doing more stuff with Rebecca's, um, crap, what was I getting at? Oh. FOMO. Oh, right, right, right. right. Which, Thank you. sorry, let me just jump in for a quick second. In case anybody doesn't know, FOMO, F O M O, is an acronym for fear of missing out. Yes. <laughs> Important note. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I specifically said to the field director, don't try to make me like jealous of anything that's going on. And yet he repeatedly did that and also did a lot of other ableist things that I, I quit that. But um, yeah, that's like one thing that like another thing that makes this environment, like the campaign environment, like less accessible is that it's just like, don't make people feel like shit. And it's like, I understand that like it works with a lot of people, but then you also have people like us who will push ourselves till we run our bodies into the ground. And yeah. it's just not, we don't need people we're already motivated enough. We don't need this right. bullshit, you know? And it's it's a really interesting thing too, because like disabled people in the current slash like always, but in the current political landscape, like we have so much to lose and like we have such a stake in what's going on. And so desperately a lot of the time want to be involved and want to help. But when you are running campaigns that aren't accessible in various ways 
then we can't do that. And like that fucking sucks, you know? And that's why, you know, I'm really excited to be doing get out the vote work and, you know, gearing up for 2022. Like that's definitely going to be a primary focus for us. Um, but it's just, yeah, that guilt tripping and the just like the feeling of, and sometimes I don't know how much of this is just like internalized because I'm like so hard on myself, but like, it's, like the thought of mustering up the courage to like going up to somebody and saying like, I'm leaving this event early because I'm about to break out in tears from how much pain I'm in is like terrifying. I'm like, please don't think I'm weak. My body is falling apart. I'm (laughs) so bad at like admitting to pain or anything. And then there's like the whole other issue of like the abled's getting uncomfortable by the fact that like we're always in pain, which like, I understand why they're uncomfortable, but it also makes it like harder to tell people things because like I hate pity face. Mm. Pity face is just the worst. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to be pitied. That's just not how I want to do things here. Right. I just want them to be like, okay, cool. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Whenever you feel better. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot of complexity with just like you know, for a party, at least a a sector of a party at progressives who are like against capitalist ideologies, they sure do promote them (laughs) in organizing work with all the cost enableism. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's so frustrating because it's, you know, I, one of my really good friends has been I'm gonna have them on the podcast soon I think they're really really wonderful um but they recently had an experience where they were working for a um an organizing group and they just would not uh, the their boss would not accommodate them at all um and they were like I'm going to quit if you don't accommodate me and they were like okay bye like that is how like expendable it seems people are sometimes and it's just so sad because people like really put their heart and soul into this work and it's like we're not asking for anything super difficult you know like the stuff they were asking for was like very like honestly just like good communication practices (laughs) like aside from being an accommodation um but it's just like yeah it 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 takes me off to no end because again, like our community and obviously, especially people who are multiply marginalized within the disabled community have such a personal stake in a lot of this stuff and like need to be included, but can't be if the fucking white boys club at the top doesn't, uh, you know, take us seriously or, or make a concerted effort to include us. Definitely. That is for sure. Um, let me think. Oh, what's the most ridiculous thing someone has said to you relating to your disabilities? It's hard to pick, right? Uh, <laughs> so many, so many stories. Where do I start? Oh, here's a good one since we were talking about organizing. So pandemic, election, people are wearing masks. Jules is very deaf, relies on lip reading, goes to the polls to vote, as is my duty as an American citizen, slash I missed the uh, absentee voting deadline, so I had to do it in person. Um, And um, so I have something called an FM system, which, well, I don't have it anymore because it belonged to my university and it's no longer in my possession, which makes me very sad, but someday we'll get a new one. But essentially what it is, is it's a device that um, wirelessly loops into your hearing aids. It's like a personal amplification device. So imagine like, it looks like basically just like a a thicker like pen uh, and it's got like a little like microphone on it. And like, it's very just like, kind of like an innocuous looking like cylinder. Um, And so I show up to the polls and, you know, I won't get into every way that this polling site was inaccessible because that could be another fucking podcast. But uh, 
long story short, I get up to the the table where they, you know, ask for your name and like get make sure you're registered and get your ballot. And I put my uh, I was holding my FM system out to the uh, the the attendant or the the volunteer, and they were like, "You can't record in here." I was like, "Oh, I'm not recording. Like this is like." And I was like, "Okay, maybe they've never seen an FM system before. Fine." Um, so I like explained to them what it is, and they were like. Mm, yeah but does it have recording capabilities and I was like no it is literally just so I can maybe kind of hear you like what is your fucking deal and so it it ended up being like a five minute plus encounter and like the people behind me are getting pissed off because I'm holding up the line and like the other volunteers are rolling their eyes at me and it was just so embarrassing and so like frustrating and like I'm like, I'm just trying to fucking vote, dude. Like, hand me the piece of paper and send me on my way, okay? Like, I'm not trying to, like, Edward Snowden, the Barrington, New Hampshire election site. Oops, I name dropped. Whatever. Fuck you, Barrington. Um, Like, it's not that deep. Um, And so, yeah. I would say that's that's up there in the most ridiculous ones. Um, Also, the time that I was, uh, it was, like, near when I first got my hearing aids and was, like, having to explain to everybody in the music world how they work and what they do. And I was um, hired to play in this like semi-professional orchestra in the region. And the director was kind of a, just one of those guys. And I was uh, also working on promotion for it. And I was uh, with him, like putting together some paperwork. And he was like, so are those things going to make a bunch of distracting noises while we're trying to rehearse? I was like, what do you think a hearing aid does, bro? Like, do you think it just plays like fucking like ringtones? Like, <laughs> do you have any concept of what they do? And he was like, well, you know, sometimes they like beep and like squeal. I'm like, not if they're made after the year 1957. Like, <laughs> what is your problem? So yeah, it's just like, it's just silly like I I know that people mean well like 90% of the time but it's just like constant like having to explain 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 and at least like I mean I'm sure like you know for me at least deafness slash hearing loss are things that are like easy enough to kind of explain like people can wrap their heads around them when you get into like the chronic illness territory that is like People straight up no impossible idea. yeah 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 I never know where to start and where to end like it's just yeah that is yes very I what's, hate it what's your ridiculousness story <sighs> okay well there was like that time when someone said my fingers must not be disabled because I can type really fast <gasps> That was really funny. Like, I wasn't even offended. It was just so funny. Stop. Um, and then, oh, there was, like, another thing that I was thinking of, but I can't remember. Damn it. Oh, that brings me into my next question. What's your least favorite part of having ADHD? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, like, <laughs> I just, like, my brain is controlled by like a million tiny little worms who all want different things. Like that's what it feels like on a daily basis. And so I was only like recently diagnosed with ADHD. So I've been like reconciling, like looking back in my life and being like, that's why, that's why I'm like that. (laughs) Um, And like, I think the toughest thing for me about it is finding a balance between like craving stimulation, like not like physically being like incapable of being bored. Like I cannot do nothing for more than like two minutes or I will die. And so like, it's like, a sh- like, like sharks have to c- keep continuously swim forward. If they stop, they will die because like, that's how I feel. I'm like a shark. Um, and so, Same. yeah. And so sometimes I'm just like, you know, after I catch my like second or third wind at like 10 PM, I'm like, cool, what's next? Like, I would love to sleep right now. And I absolutely cannot. And it's just like, 
ding, 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 like little like ping pong balls, like shooting back and forth in there. And, you know, I like, people talk about like, oh, having ADHD is good actually, because you're like creative and shit, which is like true. Like I honestly, I think I would not be able to juggle as much as I do without my brain being wired that way. But at the same time, it's like fucking exhausting. (laughs) Agreed. I have like the same feelings. It's like, I get like so hyper fixated on things too, that like, it's exhausting. I just like cannot stop thinking about like these like just random ass things that like don't matter at all, Um, which is better than focusing on things. Well, I do obsess over important things, but like also I spend a lot of time like hyper fixating on things that just don't matter at all. And then the whole like lack of executive functioning is an issue. Mm -hmm. Like I just started factoring in transportation time into like my schedule, like right before COVID started. I never like thought like, oh, I need to allow this much time to get from one place to another. So I would just like show up at appointments late and at the wrong time. And then as you know, I put things in my calendar the wrong way. Sometimes like there was this one time where I just wrote doctor something and then did not write the address, didn't write the name, nothing, no identifying information. And then there was another time my physical therapist called me and she was like, you're standing me up. And I was like, oh, that's what it, I pretty much added a new event and then forgot to label it. And so it just said new event. <laughs> so I didn't know where to go. So I just didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Oh my um, God. Yeah. Both well, of those things have happened in the past like three months. Like things like that happen just like all the time. That is too fucking real. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> that is, like I just don't even like sometimes I like think about the things that I do and I'm like, how did that even happen? Right. Like how could I have been so in such a state that I created a calendar event and did not name it anything? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just put like, I guarantee you, I'm going to open my scheduling app right now. There's going to be some really vague, or there's going to be an acronym that has no definition that I'm yes. going to be like, I'll remember that later. Yep. Like maybe. Oh, for example, tonight, FFA. So I had a meeting at seven for fair fight action, which is FFA. And then also had this freak for accessibility, which is also FFA. Did not distinguish between the two in any way, shape or form. Uh, And then like, sometimes I'll just put like somebody's name if I'm meeting up with them. Like I have an event scheduled on Sunday that's just called Robin. And I'm like, I know three people named Robin. I don't remember who I scheduled anything with and I don't know what the fuck we're doing. So like, I guess I got to figure that out now. (laughs) Like, It's just, there's, it it never ends. Literally never, like never ever. And then it's like, it's like, oh, you learn your lesson. No, you don't. Lesson no. not learned. I lesson wish not. lesson was learned. Cause it's like, as soon as like, it's like using the brain worms analogy. Like if there's like one worm that like starts to learn its lesson, 300 other worms come in and just like- And just eat it. it. It's like, ah, never mind. Yeah. Like, you. We're gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> then like the other- thing I will say that's bad about ADHD that I did not realize was attributable to ADHD is that the like compulsive need to interrupt people (laughs) otherwise we'll forget what we're saying but then also I flip out when people interrupt me because I'm like now I don't know what I'm saying I never know what I'm saying yeah like I just just forget what I'm saying by the end of the sentence Yes. Or like, <laughs> never just like start talking and like not know why you're talking or what. <laughs> it's like the, like, at no point do I know like what's going to happen next. Like, <laughs> oh, that is like a daily occurrence. <laughs> like, let's be real. Relatable content, folks. That's what we're here to provide. We love it. We love it. All right. Well, <sighs> I'm tired, so I'm gonna. Damn, this was so this fun. This was wicked fun. Um, what do you want to plug in terms of social media or links or anything? And I will put them in like the description and stuff when I post this. I guess just my Twitter. 
Not Sarah Fish. Sarah E. Fish, because Sarah Fish was taken. I know, right? Who the hell is that? So S A R A E F I S C H. Correct. Cool. Good job. Thank Impressive. you. I'm looking at your name yeah. on the screen right now. Okay, that is, I forgot <laughs> that it's there. Okay, I clearly need to sleep. <laughs> All done. Um, cool. Yeah, everyone go follow Sarah on Twitter. She's super cool and has fire tweets. And uh, we will catch you next time on another exciting yeah. episode of Freak for Accessibility. Bye.